Hey everyone, I'm Abby with SpiceWorks and I'd like to welcome you to today's SpiceWorks Partner Webinar, Five Reasons to Monitor Employee Computer Usage Now and One Reason Not To, brought to you by SpectreSoft. Before we get started, I wanted to draw your attention to the question box on your screen. Here you can type in as many questions as you'd like and our presenters will try to get to as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Also, we will be recording the webinar, so if you have to step away for any reason, you will receive an email with a link to the recording in about a week. So now that we have all the housekeeping done, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today. We have Matt Farr, who is an engineer for Spectrosoft. We also have Paul Down, who is the VP of Sales for Spectrosoft. Paul is going to get us started, so Paul, whenever you are ready, take it away. Great. Thanks, Abby. Well, good afternoon or, or good morning, everyone, depending on uh, where you are in the world today, and welcome to our presentation. Um, as Abby said, I'm Paul, so you can put a name with the accent, um, and I'll be working today with Matt, uh, who has a, a distinctly different accent, as you can probably tell. Um, and so we're going to be working through the, uh, the presentation talking about the, the five reasons to monitor employees and one reason not to. Um, Matt, do you want to say hello? Yep. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Uh, on the webinar. Thanks, Matt. If you can move on to the next slide, if we talk about the agenda. So let's have a look at, at what we're going to talk about today. Um, there's really two things we're going to talk about. The first thing is you know, the most common reasons that organizations have, have chosen uh, to use the technology from Spectrosoft, as well as you know, one reason why organizations, organizations may not. Um, before we go into that in, in detail, just a, a very, very small snippet about Spectrosoft. Uh, we've been around a long time. We've been around since '98, and we support some in the region of 36,000 corporate customers in over 100 countries worldwide. Um, it's, it's pretty safe to say that when it comes to employee monitoring, we are the pioneers and, and leaders in that space around the globe. So, as the agenda suggests, um, we're going to give you some specific use cases. Uh, we're going to, I'm also going to throw in there some, some customer examples of how organisations are using our technology and, and why people aren't. Um, also, at the end of the presentation, there's going to be a, a white paper link um, to actually talk about uh, how to implement an employee monitoring. So if we move on to the next slide and talk about the, the reason number one. So we see this every day of the week. You know, there, there's a, a specific reason that people come to us, and it's pretty simple, that something has happened within an organization or they believe that something uh, is going to happen. Now, in all those situations, whatever, regardless, it always requires an investigation. Um, now, when we're talking about an investigation, this is something that isn't easy to do. However, if you have the facts and you have the digital evidence behind that, it's something that needs to be done. Um, the sort of things we're looking at in terms of investigations are, are, are the facts like who did it, when did they do it, why they do it, how and, and what did they do. But the goal of any investigation is to provide irrefutable evidence that an investigation, um, you know, is proven correct. If you look at the second one, you know, it's true that investigations are a fact of corporate life. They happen all the time, um, regardless of the size of your company. And I think, as I've mentioned before, the challenge is answering those questions to determine, you know, whether the intent was there or whether it was actually accidental. Did someone do something on purpose or did they accidentally leak a file um, just through a, a minor negligence? So I think in terms of gathering this data, finding it quickly, Finding it easily and the ability to present it in a way without any date, uh, sorry, without any doubt, is definitely the result that we desire. Um, I think in terms of investigation, it's probably a good point to, uh, you know, we don't want it death by PowerPoint today. I'm going to now ask Matt to um, open 360 and we'll, and we'll take a look at the technology quickly and, and look at it in the context of an investigation. So, Matt, if you can throw that up for me, there we go. So, I think in this instance, if we, um, I know Matt's going to talk about it in detail, but I think it's the, the, the pane on the top left there. I've, it's been brought to my attention by one of my management teams that Tara has been moving a lot of files around the organization. So Matt, if I was to come to you and say, okay, what does that mean? What can you show me? Um, let me hand it to you. Okay, exactly, Paul. So in a scenario where we would say, uh, and the one thing with Spectre 360 is uh, utilizing the, the back end component, the relational database, it's gathering this information and giving you aggregated data so that you can see trends and you can analyze data even from a very high level. Uh, that allows you to identify uh, events that may be abnormal, uh, red flags, so to speak, 
Uh, or you can just simply use it for productivity measurements, averages, things of that nature to get a better handle on what's happening in your environment. But in this scenario, if I, if I look at a chart such as users copying the most files, and this could be set up or, uh, let's say, uh, filtered to include various types of file copies, whether it's to removable disks or to the cloud or to from the network to the local drive, whatever the case may be, I can see that I know, you know, Paul, what if I told you that the average for my team, let's, uh, the sales team here, is usually only one or two files a day. And then I look at Terra and I tell you that Terra has moved, you know, dozens of files per day. Would you say that would raise some, uh, you know, how would you feel about that? Would that raise suspicion yeah, well, or would that? Well, Matt, I think it would just raise immediate attention. It's a red flag. It's a definite red flag. And I think that graph shows that straight away. Um, it's something that would definitely need to be investigated further. Right, so if I wanted to, I could drill down into Terra's information and actually look at the individual events for that particular user, in this case, which is Terra. And I see here, and then Paul, what if I told you that by drilling down and looking at that information in a little more detail, I would tell you that Terra has been moving data from the, from the share uh, to what looks like her, my documents directory. And then uh, even yet, I tell you that the data she's moving is uh, company priceless. Yeah, well, that, so, <laughs> I know. The, I know the initial pain was uh, panel was uh, quite alarming, but looking at this, this is you know this is confidential IP or confidential data that must not be leaving the, leaving the building. So, um, I'd probably be pulling my hair out at this point. Sure, and I think, and I think from this standpoint, in a lot of scenarios, um, you, know, you want to know why is she doing this. You know, we see the events. We know that she indeed moved this information. Um, but do we have context around this? Do we want to know why she did this? Or if there are other suspicious events around this? So what I can do with the Spectre 360 uh, information at this point is I say, you know what, obviously we have uh, very just, you know, we have just cause to look into Tara's information a little bit uh, in more detail. So I could actually go to Tara's uh, data and look at her data as a whole and here, if I go to my email activity for a similar date range, you know, about 6 p.m. on that day, now I see that there's an email where she's saying, here are the price lists you were asking for. And, yeah. Paul, if I told you that, you know, not only did she, doubt, you know, bring all that, those files down, but I have a, a corresponding email around that same time where I can prove by looking at the snapshot of her desktop that she indeed was sending these price lists to some unknown uh, Gmail address. Yeah, well, that'd be a major concern. I, I think um, this is, you know, proving beyond doubt that this person is emailing stuff out the business where she shouldn't be. However, so here's the twist to this, uh, and the and the I, I should say the uh, the final part to this is, you know, we're we're gathering all this information. We obviously see she moved data. We obviously see she attached these files, but as I'm looking at these, the email, her email history, I, I suddenly see that there is a, uh, an email, an inbound email, an email she received from that strange Gmail address. So that's kind of interesting to me uh, because obviously I see that she's been sending that data to that address, but what did she receive from that particular address? I look at the preview of that email and Paul, what does it tell us? It tells us that, in fact, this is actually her boss's Gmail account. He's traveling. His hard drive fails. He desperately needs those price lists to show in a presentation and ask her to, to go ahead and send them to him. Yeah. I think the, the crazy thing here, Matt, is that um, you know, as, a, as a sales manager, you know, I'd be pulling my hair out and, and, and spitting fire knowing that someone had emailed this stuff out of the organization. However, by showing what's actually happening in context before and after, as she turns out that this, she wasn't doing anything bad at all. Correct. Correct. So uh, I think this example really shows that, you know, obviously the, the details that we can pull from the user side and just to mention, you know, with the application, we can alert ourselves of the various steps within this process. So we could have actually received an alert when Tara moved those files. Uh, we could have received an alert when she sent an email that had the word confidential in it or something of that nature. 
So not only uh, are we able to go in and really put all these events together and, you know, in this scenario, realize that, hey, it was a legitimate um, situation and reason why Tara did this, uh, but we could have been notified uh, all the way along in the process to, um, to, to know that these activities took place within our environment. Yeah. No, I agree. I think what, what you we what discussed there, Matt, in terms of the alerting is, is the majority of the way our customers actually use this. So, you know, they'll be alerted to a keyword or a file moving or whatever it may be. Um, but also some of our customers are using it as an informal investigation, whether it be a, a weekly checkpoint they do, a review. Um, this could be HR, executives, managers, or, or whoever you want. Um, but I think in, in terms of what our customers typically use it for investigations for the likes of data theft and data leaks and, and DLP, whatever you choose to call it, um, we do have some uh, some more serious use cases in the UK, for example, where we have a, a number of UK police forces who you know, have su successfully convicted police officers in the UK courts for corruption. Right. Um, and some of these cases have, have been in the paper. Um, you know, we've been told by the police forces that the reports that are generated from Spectresoft have formed the backbone of their formal investigations and, and subsequent prosecutions. So, you know, I know this is an extreme example, but it does give some some background and some gravitas to the to the accuracy and, and the reliance that some of our customers are actually putting on the data and the reports that we produce. So, right. there we go. So I think we can move on then, Matt. I think we go to the next slide for reason number two. Okay, uh, in terms of employee litigation, I think this is something that possibly scares every HR manager uh, or any manager within a company. Um, what we are seeing in Europe is, is some significant changes in employee rights, employee laws, um, and we're seeing these laws getting stricter to protect the employees, which of course is, is the right thing to do. Um, however, sometimes things don't go to plan and for whatever reason, employee ends up leaving an organization and there can be some subsequent um, actions that happen there. So if we look at the first point there in terms of wrongful termination, um, you know, let's be frank, uh, getting sued by an ex-employee can be painful, can be expensive, uh, regardless of the fault, blame or, or relevance. Uh, what we have found here specifically in the UK is that the average cost to defend an employee tribunal is about £10,000 and that's regardless of the result, uh, whether it makes it a call or whether it doesn't. Um, you can advance on a couple more, please, Matt. So, as I said there, defending can cost a lot of money. Um, so in terms of the point there about documentation, you know, if we had a way to document, or our customers had a way to document uh, the employee's working practices, their digital behavior, um, and bear in mind that pretty much everything you know, our employees do is non-verbal, or everything, that's, sorry, everything they do which isn't not uh, verbal is, is electronic, you know, we'll have the evidence to support either the employees can claim or you know, for the organization to defend against them. I think in reality, um, providing this evidence typically means a case doesn't get to court. Uh, a couple of points here in terms of you know, some reference. So if we look at the Telegraph newspaper in the UK, they stated last year that only, oh, to the slide, there we go. It, in the UK, only one in 10 cases sees an employee win a tribunal. Um, the reason that number is so low is because most of the settlements are actually out of court. But what we do need to realize is that in 10 out of 10 cases, cases the company always loses money to legal fees. And that's, and that may be in addition to any payoffs. So you know, the Institute of Directors in the UK say that half of small businesses in the UK, they, they fear taking on staff because the employee laws are so tough. So we need to make sure that we're, uh, we're pretty close on that. So Matt, as you move on to the last one there, we actually got a, a quote there from uh, one of our customers, which is IMV Projects. Um, you know, these guys weren't a customer of ours. They are now. Uh, but what they found was, you know, how difficult and what a momentous task it was to actually generate evidence or information just using the current utilities which are widely available and free, which is you know, Windows logs, emails, um, you know, file management, what do people do to files. It's really, really tough, very painful and very time consuming and often doesn't deliver the, uh, the level of detail that you need. Um, I think just one thing to say on that last slide, you know, we're not employment lawyers, we're not experts, but what we do is we give you a, a level of confidence when it comes to employee termination protection. So, slide, reason number three, they're inside. If you move on to the graphic, um, this is something we've been talking about for a long, long time at Spectresoft, which is the insider threat. Um, and I do love the use of the graphic here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, don't know the film, When a Stranger Calls, this is back from 1979. This, 
this, in this horror movie, somebody is calling and haunting this woman. Um, and it's only when the police finally trace the caller, they find out that the caller is actually in the same house as the victim. You know, pretty scary stuff. Um, but to actually define, you know, inside a threat in the corporate workplace, um, what does it actually mean? Um, I would say that the insider threat is at the forefront of, of most security officers, security managers, or even IT admins' mind. And to define it, we're talking about people who work for you, have the authorized access, but actually using these privileges in the appropriate way. It's, it's, it's wrongdoing by someone who has the power to do it. And if we look at the next point, why, why is insider threat so difficult to protect against? Well. Most organizations or most technology companies don't actually look at insider threat in the same way that Spetsoft do. So we know that organizations and customers have spent millions of pounds on um, other security technologies. And talk, we're talking about securing devices, the networks, the firewalls, keeping tags on privileges. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a place for all these technologies. But what they don't do is actually focus on the individual who could be leaking data or IP from an organization. So. You know, heaven forbid if there is someone hell bent on taking something from your company and they have the privileges to do it, then regardless of what device, network, perimeter defenses you have, it won't stop, stop them at all. So if you move on a bit a little bit, Matt, you know, I, I don't want to scaremonger everybody on the call thinking that all, all employees are evil because they're not. Um, and as that point mentions there, it's, it's very much focused on the individual and having a, a broad line employee monitoring in place will actually identify those, those bad eggs within the organization. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that we, uh, Spetasoft, uh, attended a, a CISO forum last year. And what was really frightening was that, that every single CISO, and bear in mind these guys were from national and international uh, house no, uh, sorry, household named organizations, they had all experienced some form of data leak or theft. Some of them hadn't been reported, but, but each and every one of them said they had experienced them from that. So if we move on to the next one. So this is a this is a really cool phrase. Now, what we're saying by this is that we you know we shouldn't scrutinise everybody. We're, we're just talking about putting something in place that alerts you as a business owner or manager to suspicious activity. Now, we know that there's been an awful lot of uh, coverage for the likes of Snowden, uh, the Snowden scandal recent, recently, and and interestingly enough, you know this guy's role was to move sensitive data around securely, but unbeknown to his employers, you know that data ended up somewhere it shouldn't have done. Now. In terms of uh, punishment and deterrence for insider threats, when we look at the research that's been done, and, th and there's lots of it, when we talk about certainty of punishment, whether that be in a corporate workplace for job loss or litigation, the certainty of being punished is much more powerful deterrent than the severity of the punishment. So, you know, the real startling fact is that when people leave your organization, they take data and IP with them. Now, various reports and surveys around the web will suggest anything between 50 to 80% of staff take data with them when they leave. Now, even if you take that lower figure, this is, this is still dark reading for any business owner, uh, executive or manager, because people really do think it's OK to take data when they leave. They really do. Uh, whether it be, you know, I wrote that bit of code, or these are my sales contacts, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's just it's just frightening stuff. And I think Matt, it may be a good time to uh, jump back into the product. Actually, let's have a look at some uh, some insider threat detection. Sure thing. And I think um, we we can actually tie that even in uh, to the previous example. Uh, obviously, we saw Tarashi move some information off the network and then emailed it. And you know, in other ways, and I think one of the more powerful. Um, pieces of the functionality you'll find within the Spectre 360 uh, product suite uh, is what we call the keyword detection and the keyword scanning, or key phrases even. And, you know, Paul, if I were to tell you, you know, you look at a chart like this uh, within the application, and I see that some of our uh, keywords that would indicate some sort of fraudulent activity, and these come from uh, various sources uh, where we have write-off, special fees, it's a gray area, it's off the books. Uh, confidential, intellectual property, these are all phrases or keywords that we can put into the system and if there are events such as communication via email or chat uh, that involve these uh, type of keywords or this type of language or verbiage, uh, the application can alert us and it also can show us this. So, you know, if I told you I had a, a chart like this where I've got uh, fraudulent uh, phrases such as write-off and, you know, I've got a, P, uh, a chart that's uh, 
spiked out like this, I can go in and I can see, you know, individuals who actually have used this verbiage. And again, I think the most important here, thing here, Paul, is the context, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we can obviously see that, that Frank, using Outlook, obviously sent an email that contained some of those uh, key words. You know, and... Um, yeah, see, the I first thing I see there, where your, where your mouse is, Matt, is um, the fact that someone's typing in, you know, wants to get the PO process with the special fees. You know, that's a, that's a major red flag. You know, what, would it, what is special fees? Right. I, I can't see any good connotation for the phrase special fees. Right, right. And then we could even, if you need that, you know, from an insider standpoint, you have a security team, uh, you know, you can get a visual on this action. So we can look at the screenshot uh, of the particular event when it took place on that user's desktop. So here we can see uh, Frank typing this message in where we see the write-off keyword in the email or the special fee yeah. key in the, within the email. And uh, if necessary, uh, we can even drop this out for an investigation. We can show the info of the time and the date down here in the bottom right-hand corner of when the event took place, uh, who triggered the event, the machine, et cetera. And these type of uh, visual sequences, these desktop screenshots, can actually be saved to a sequence of images or to a video that your security personnel could play back and uh, watch like a movie, essentially. No, that's good stuff, man. That's good. Uh, I think so that's, um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, in terms of, we're talking about insider threats, and you know, we haven't shown as much detail or context as we did with the first demonstration, but we're just showing a different element of the product, and, and once again, it's showing a red flag where we believe that someone's doing something they shouldn't be. Um, and again, and again Mike, if you, want to, if you want to build context around that, you could again dive into, well, you know, what is Frank doing then? Uh, you know, we can look at some other data such as uh, again document tracking by devices and emails sent and received and you know if we drill down into Frank's information for document tracking well what do we see in the first uh, group of events here we've got Dropbox client activity that's obviously yeah. a, another red flag and again we can see the snapshot of Frank's activity and we see that well sure enough um, <clears throat> Frank is sending out intellectual property yeah okay Okay, that's good stuff, Matt. Okay, I think if we go back to the the, the slides, I know we talked about the, the certainty versus uh, severity. I think if employees knew that a protected, protected monitoring solution was in place, then the number of incidents would definitely fail. Um, and I think also the context by showing what happened before, during, and after, you know, gives you proof that something's happened. Um, okay, let's move on to the next slide, Matt. So, more is better. Um, who's going to disagree with that? Um, this is probably uh, probably the, the second most important reason that people come to us. Um, it's, it's all surrounding productivity. So, if we're talking about more is better, of course, product, more productivity is better. Um, and this is a, a very very uh, common use case for us. If we talk about the the Hawthorne effect as that's shown there, um, this is a, a really old study. It was actually done back in the 1950s from uh, I think data that actually went back to the 20s or 30s, where Hawthorne's an electric company. Now, what it did find is that employees who were observed um, obviously did more work. Now, in those days, the monitoring was, was more physical and, and, and visual than what we're talking about today. However, the results today are the same when it comes to employee monitoring. Um, if we look at the next point, Matt, What we should be seeing now is a, is a, a couple of uh, URLs, which is uh, the first one's a New York, New York Times article, and the second one is, is a report. Um, now, what this uh, demonstrates, and the report's actually called Cleaning House, the Impact of Information Technology Monitoring on Employee Theft and Productivity. This is all about the monitoring or electronic monitoring of staff. In this instance, it's uh, nearly 400 restaurants in, in 39 states in the US. And what they were doing, um, in the restaurant shade, obviously, there's a lot of theft, um, a lot of uh, drinks and food that's not put through in terms of tips, etc. cetera. Um, but what happened was, with the implementation of monitoring of staff, they saw a 7% increase in revenue per week. Now, the impact was not firing the bad staff. Because the staff knew they were being monitored, they actually performed better. Um, and because uh, they were doing better, they were getting more tips, they were getting doing a better job. 
Um, and when you consider the theft typically accounts for 1% in this industry, and the profit margins could be anything from 2 to 5%, you know, a 7% increase in revenue is definitely a win-win. Um, and those two articles are there, so you want to have a look uh, afterwards. If we move to the last point on this slide, um, it's actually a, a case study that we do have on our website, which is a, a UK uh, football club called Blackburn Rovers. Um, and what we can see that what Ben says there is that productivity is up. You can see it. You know, they had some issues with uh, productivity, lots of time spent on the web, and with the implementation of Spectrosoft, you know, productivity was up almost immediately. So let's move to the next slide. So, of course, better is better. Um, if you advance again, Matt, I, th I think it's very important that when talking about a technologist, it's not um, it's not always about finding bad eggs in the company. It's also about identifying the best, but equally as important, those people who could do with more help and could do a better job through mentoring and training. Now, um, when you look at the first image, you, some of you may not recognize this man, but, but if you do, he's Sir Alex Ferguson. He's the legendary manager of Manchester United, one of the most famous football teams in the world. Uh, and Alex, or Sir Alex, should I say, he managed the team from 86 to 2013. So, now, he was there a long time, one of the most admired managers and respected managers in the game. In fact, so much so, he was knighted by the Queen in 99. Now, why do we have a picture of this guy here? Well, um, if you move on, please, Matt, to the, the second and third image, he's on this because his preparation and the tools he used and how he managed a, a very large squad of players was, was, um, was pretty good. Um, he was one of the first ever managers to use video playback, analysis, uh, and what this allowed him to do was identify issues, but offer remedies and solutions as well. You know, he was a master tactician. Not only did he get the best out of his players, but utilizing the most appropriate players for the right role against specific teams. Um, he was also very, very well known for his mentoring as well. So bringing on some of the best homegrown talent through junior academies to play for you know, Manchester United first team, but also to go on and play for the country as well. So he was a, a true master mentor. Now, obviously, if only businesses are on the same, um, it's important to know that you know our solutions allow companies to identify you know those issues, uh, potential problems, but more importantly, how to address them. You know, it's very quick to understand who's using applications. Are they using it enough? Are the keystrokes lower than other people in their team? You know, we can help identify that. Um, there is a quote on this slide. Um, the final thing on this, which uh, is another case study, which is available online, which is about setting uh, employees up for success. Um, this is another example of, of you know, finding some issues, but actually measuring the staff and then providing um, remediation to that. So we've done the good reasons. We've done the five reasons why. So let's move on to the next slide. You know, why do people not want to monitor employees? Um, so I've been called Big Brother on many occasions. Um, some people consider us that. I'd like to consider that we're um, that looking at everything we've covered off so far, that you'd be in agreement that firms actually can't afford to be without some form of monitoring solution. And I think if you look at the first point there and people say we're too intrusive, well, <sighs> data and employee privacy is a major concern in, in Europe right now. It's a major, major consideration um, with the varying levels of concern that comes from you know, country to country, continent to continent, it's all very, very different. But we believe that the attitude is, to privacy is definitely, definitely shifting. Um, let me give an example. So in, in the UK, in, in, um, uh, for every single person in the UK, there's, there, sorry, for 11, uh, every 11 people in the UK, there's one CCTV camera in place. Now, you can't drive in and out of London um, without being photographed three or four times. Um, there, people are just actually used to being monitored. Um, so I, I think that now people are used to that in their private life. I think the security is important to them also in their corporate life as well. And as individuals, we all go home, we install computer programs on our home PCs, our mobile phones, our cell phones to protect us. However, sometimes we don't even query or validate the software we're putting on. Um, but anyway, look, we understand data privacy. We did a survey, which is shown by that first graphic there. And what we did is we targeted uh, workers outside of Spetsoft, outside of our customers, and we, and we talked to uh, 200 people. Now, I'll read the question out. So if your employer monitored your work and personal activities on your company issued device, would it be acceptable? Now, I don't know whether this is the answer is a surprise to you or not, but the answer is that the result was 79% of individuals responded that, yes, that was OK. So that's great. But if we move on to the next graphic, we thought we'd run the same 
question again, but to a different set of 200 people, just to actually validate what we've said. And what we're seeing here, as you can see, exactly the same question, and we're only seeing a 2% shift. We're only seeing that you know 77 people, 77% are actually saying that it's okay to be monitored, not on a corporate device. So I think it's safe to conclude that staff are willing to be monitored. And I think if we take a step back and look at the bigger picture, you know, why wouldn't staff be willing to to be open to protecting and monitoring their corporate issue devices? Because these devices contain data, IP. You know, if this data went missing, this could seriously damage the organisation but also the very jobs of the people that are using those devices as well, and I think that's important to know. Um, so employees don't mind being monitored, companies have the right to do it, um, and this is often reflected in uh, the, the company's acceptable use of IT policy. We talk about this a lot, a lot of customers ask us, ask us about it, you know, is it okay to monitor? And we say, well, yeah, um, you know, there's samples of acceptable use policies around, and it just needs to say something on the lines of, you know, we reserve the right to protect and monitor our IT assets and the work being performed on it, et cetera. So there we go. So that's that slide. Okay, so we talked about Big Brother. We talked about why we should do it. We talked about how people are happy to do it. Um, in terms of what we do, um, I think it's pretty simple to conclude from this slide that we actually collect a lot of data. Um, we do collect this data on the device, whether it's on a network, off a network, on a plane, train, or, or wherever that may be. So yes, we do collect but a lot of data, but we also allow our customers to pick and choose what data they collect by policy, by group, group or by user. Um, and although some of our customers, like the police forces, for example, you know, they'll do a, a capture all for everyone policy, uh, the majority of, do actually have different level of monitoring for different people or different groups. Um, so, you know, for example, with a police investigation, you would record everything that user does, including screen snapshots, which then gives you the video like playback recordings afterwards. Whereas other organizations, uh, they just could be monitoring, for example, a call center. Uh, we do have a couple of very large call centers in the UK that use this technology where they're monitoring the user activity. They're monitoring their keystrokes and the applications and the cases they close to determine you know, the, the productivity of those workers. So just to pick a couple of the elements on that screen, um, let's talk about uh, the chat and IM. You know, the, the power of, of chat and IM now is, is, is so big where um, not only do your staff talk to other people inside your company, but they also have the ability to share files and do much more with people outside. So obviously we capture and record that activity as well. Um, we talk about web history, website visited. You know, this is a big thing. Um, Facebook is still number one in terms of uh, the, the work interruption. But what we do is slightly different. You know, we can have a Facebook window open all day, but only be active for 20 minutes. That's how we report that. Other products don't report it like that. They'll just report this open all day. And I think as we've touched on as well, when Matt talked about the products, we talked about document tracking, file transfers, uh, email, web, uh, webmail as well. So, on to the next slide. So when we talk about what's right for you, there's, there's two flavors or two versions of, of Spectre 360 available to you. There's Spectre 360 and there's Spectre 360 Recon. Now we've categorized this into active monitoring and passive monitoring, and I'm going to go into that in more detail as will Matt on the following slide. So in terms of active monitoring, let me give you uh, three examples there. So the first one would be that the rule number one that we talked about, an investigation. You know, people need to um, go back, look at data, look at it in contacts, look at the history, look at screen snapshots, let's do video playback. You know, we need to explain and define and prove what exactly has happened and whether that is intentional or accidental. Uh, another use case could be uh, a role-based cause. You know, we, we have um, super users in our businesses who have, you know, significantly ele elevated privileges. They've got the keys to the kingdom. They can do more damage, um, and that can be very, very painful. Um, in fact, I did have one guy, uh, sorry, one customer who said that they worked for a very large German automotive, or automotive firm, and when he joined the company, he used to spend two weeks in each department within the business. By the time he actually found his true role within that business, he was probably the most powerful IT user in the business because he kept those privileges. So, you know, it's, these guys have the keys to the kingdom, whether they do it accidental or intentional, we need to keep an eye on that. Um, the other one is something like conditional cause. So let's look at um, someone who's left the business. It could be on, on good grounds. Um, but you may want to take a closer look. You know, did they take something with them? You know, statistics say 50 to 80% of people do take stuff with them, so let's go back and have a look. 
Um, in terms of passive, so this is where we're talking about Spectre, uh, Spectre 360 Recon. You know, this is all about collecting the data, logging it, but not making it available for reporting. You know, data is kept locally. Um, we'll run alerts from it, but it's data just in case you need it. So that's why we call it passive. Um, I think we'll look at that in more details, Matt. Should we go to the next slide? And I'll hand back to you. Yep. So if you were to uh, look at the the different uh, models, the two different modes, really, of Spectre 360, you have the detail active monitoring and the re versus the recon mode. Uh, the detail mode is very much uh, like the examples we looked at with the scenarios earlier within the webinar. Uh, in detail mode, uh, Spectre 360 is, in fact, collecting all that information from the endpoint, you know, whether it's the chat, the document tracking, and so forth. And I think it's important to mention that uh, these, are, these are not all or nothing type uh, features. These are items that you can enable, disable, um, create uh, specific uh, settings for that may filter out specific uh, sites. They may uh, make exceptions for keywords, make exceptions for uh, even users or time frames. So uh, it's by no means an all or, or nothing solution, Paul. And I think that's important to mention that uh, you enable or disable the options that meet the requirements of your environment. Uh, the recorder gathers that information in the active detail mode, and it reports that data or synchronizes that data to the data store. Uh, on a specific interval, it syncs this data to make it available within the database for us to report on. And then with the active monitoring, we also receive alerts uh, in the form of emails, uh, keyword alerts, or uh, alerts that particular actions have taken place within the environment, like we were talking about earlier, whether it's transfer of files or uh, communication uh, text that's been picked up. Uh, we can receive or um, set up and receive those alerts. And then, of course, you know, the, the end result is to be able to review and analyze that information utilizing the, uh, the application dashboard. And I think that really separates the active versus passive, uh, you know, actively the active monitoring really refers to the ability to always actively be able to review that data. Uh, that data is available for us to go in and run reports on uh, on an ongoing basis, right? So the Spectre 360 detail mode uh, allows us to collect that information and on an ongoing basis review that information, analyze it uh, right from the, the live database. Recon is a little different. And I think the, the recon mode really came into play with the balance, right? We like to use the word balance, Paul, right, between, you know, what is necessary to collect within our environment so that we are safe and secure uh, from a uh, corporate or business perspective or organizational perspective versus maintaining that uh, end user privacy. And um, here with the recon mode, we are gathering the same information. So you notice the same uh, data is being gathered from the endpoint, uh, whether it's the document tracking or the web, uh, web usage, email, communication, what, what, what not. But with the recon mode, we're handling the data quite differently. Instead of synchronizing that data up to the data store on an ongoing basis, the information is actually stored locally in an encrypted file, and only alert data is sent back to the data store. So in the recon mode, we, on the administrative side, set up alerts. Those alerts can, uh, are based on keywords that are found within, again, communications or uh, application usage, et cetera. And when those alerts are triggered, the recon uh, client sends that alert data back to the data store. It maintains end user privacy because the content of that action is not uh, sent with the alert. So let's just say, and as an example, Paul, I, uh, you know, we look at that. Uh, end user in the previous example, Frank, who sent an email with one of our keywords, right? Uh, gray area, or what was it? Um, uh, you know, special off the books or write off, whatever it may be. Special fee, I yeah. think, was another one. That would have triggered an alert, right? So if Frank sent that message, that would have triggered an alert, and the administrator or the security personnel within the organization would have received an email alert that outline that this end user on this machine at this time and date, utilizing Outlook, sent this email that contained this keyword. That's all the alert would tell you. At that point, 
you as an organization can make an educated decision on is this just cause to further investigate what Frank is doing. Uh, we don't see any con content within that email. We only are notified of the action, right? Then based on that, if that is just cause, we can use the policies in place within our organization uh, to go ahead and unlock that information off the local workstation if need be. And by unlocking that data, we're able to see it uh, in full, full view like we saw with the full detail mode of Spectre 360 where we can report on it uh, and um, run those reports and see the, the context around it and so forth. So it's an interesting combination of being able to gather all the information uh, that we need, but only accessing it if there's just cause to do so, utilizing the recon mode. So it's two different uh, methods, uh, two different approaches. That's good, Matt. I think uh, it's important to note for those people listening in that you know the data is there, whether you go for the detail mode or the recall mode. Um, it's the ability to either look at it in detail mode straight away, or whether you want to go and on all that data in in the uh, the recon mode. Um, you know, there's there's some very good examples, some instances where either both uh, or individual uses of this product is being used. Um, a number of people are using the recon because you know there could be a number of uh, distributed offices um, where they don't want to send lots of data over the wire, you know, that, that's ideal for recon. Um, and also, you know, the, the smaller offices you know, may not have the storage. They may not want to uh, store lots of information. So, uh, you know, there's, there's good cases for both. So let's move on to the next one. Thanks for that, Matt. So before we talk about the free stuff, um, let me just summarize exactly what we went through. So obviously we talked about uh, the, the five reasons where, or the five use cases which people use our technology. Um, the first one is investigations. We talked about uh, employee litigation and protecting yourself from that. We talked about the insider threat, right. uh, improved productivity, and then obviously the, the behavior analysis for improvement. Um, on the other side of that, of course, we talked about the, the biggest reason why people don't employ a monitoring solution, which is down to the big brother and privacy concerns. And I'm hoping that you know, we, we've shown and demonstrated that we can confidently overcome that. Um, so in terms of the free stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, on, this, on there, there's a, a white paper on there, which is a guide to implementing uh, an employee monitoring program uh, using that URL. <clears throat> excuse me. There's also the free trial for, for 360 and 360 recon on there as well. So um, there's also a, a, an iPad mini to be given away. I think we'll do that after the, uh, the Q&A session. Would that be good? Yep, that sounds good. We've got some good questions in here, Paul. Um, we have a lot of specific technical questions on how to use the application. Um, I think in those scenarios, if you guys are wondering how to do something within the application, uh, you can reference our administration guide uh, right from the home page of the uh, Spectre 360 application. There are links down the right-hand side that will allow you to uh, bring up the administration guide with step-by-step instructions. Uh, we also are going to be giving, uh, you know, webinars and demonstrations uh, on a bi-weekly basis this year, or at least this quarter coming up, so uh, stay tuned for that. You can also uh, view our YouTube channel for some instructional, uh, or just demonstrations of how to do things as, uh, on there as well. Um, there's, a, there's a question on there, Matt, <clears throat> which we hear all the time, which is, you know, should employees be uh, informed that this kind of monitoring activity is taking place. Our, our general response to that would be yes. Um, we do have companies that, that don't tell their employees, but the, the majority of them do. Um, it, the reason or the, the way that organizations not get around it, but you know, they should be protected and covered in the acceptable use of IT policy. It should state in there that the organization you know, reserves the right to, to protect and monitor those devices. And there's even a, a UK government website which has example um, acceptable use policies online as well, which cover that. So you know, my my general uh, opinion on that would be that you should employ your, your uh, you should tell your employees. Um, you're quite right. There was a few other more technical ones in there in terms of how to generate alarms, keywords. Um, and there's a question there about um, you know, if I've got data on a share out there. Can we see activity, you know, from folders and files within there? And and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we even kind of showed that within one of the samples there, where uh, Tara was pulling data off the network share down to her local machine, and we saw that we saw the document path, uh, the share path, right? 
So um, that's, an, that's part of what we would consider document tracking within the application, the ability to track uh, the movement of data like that, uh, whether it's network-based locally, uh, even to the cloud. Okay, I think the, the remaining questions are probably something that needs to be shown in, in detail actually on a, a demo because they're very technical. Uh, another, another question came oh, in regarding, yep. the, regarding the environment. And uh, uh, yes, we did show that in a domain environment, uh, but it does work outside a domain. If you're in a work group, uh, the application can still be run. Um, you know, there are obvious some benefits of being on the domain from a security perspective. Uh, but uh, we still can uh, implement it in a work group environment. I think the, uh, <clears throat> there's a good one there that's come in actually, uh, Matt, which is, you know, could you provide any tips for monitoring and managing um, the IT people or the people with access to the system? So it's, it's almost policing the police, if you like, which is a, which is a common question. You know, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting scenario that uh, does pop up quite a bit. and. Um, I think the biggest thing around the, that question and also the uh, question that Paul answered earlier about should we notify individuals is policy, right? Uh, technically, we can turn things on and off pretty easily with the software and we can gather the information. So from a technical perspective, even if we just talk about the recon mode, uh, you know, you've got this data held there on the local machine that can be, with the flip of a switch, basically collected and reviewed. The point of that really is not that, hey, I can you know, flip this button and I can see everything. The point of it is really, you know, what kind of policy are we going to put in place uh, from an uh, organizational perspective to, you know, determine when is it just cause to review this data, how are we going to unlock that data, who needs to be involved, and how are we going to review it. And when it comes to privileged users like IT, it's very important that uh, individuals in the organization that are responsible for that put the appropriate policy in place so that um, you, know, you are doing that in an appropriate manner, whether that means I'm going to notify IT that, hey, we're monitoring you, and if you interfere with the monitoring uh, software, that's obviously um, an event that's going to uh, be an issue. There's also situations where we can uh, do like split passwords, right, Paul, where we can have yeah. individuals from multiple departments have to come together to agree that we're going to unlock this data or we're going to review this information. And without that split password of the two people involved, the two key access, right, uh, they're not going to be able to review that data. So there's, a, there's some, you know, IT is tough because they're admins, right? Uh, a lot of times they have full reign over the organization. And they're obviously technically very savvy. So that's, that's uh, you know, these are things you have to take into consideration and where policy really becomes very powerful versus just the technical side of it. We have to put policies in place that uh, are going to allow us to monitor those individuals, those privileged users, effectively. Yeah. There's, um, there's something that's just popped in actually, Matt, which is regarding bring your own device, so BYOD. The, the question is, do you have any best practice guidelines for compatibility with BYOD policies? Now, um, it's important to know that when you install this software as a company, it's on a company-issued device. Um, so we you know we do have customers that uh, have sought permission from their employees to install this software on the employee-owned device, and that's fine. Um, now, even Gartner says that uh, bring your own device is something which is eventually going to have a demise. It's going to go away because you have no real ability to, to secure what that person's doing. Um, so in terms of our official word or best practice, I don't think we have anything for that, Matt, do we, for bring your own device, apart from stay away uh, from it? <laughs> yeah, not at this point, no. Um, uh, a lot of that usually, you know, very often uh, pertains to iPhones, iPads, things of that nature. And until Apple unlocks that iOS uh, and allows for more security uh, type uh, functionality on those devices, uh, we're kind of handcuffed in that arena. Yeah. So there was another question, Matt, where it said, can you actually see the data on the local machine that you've been recording? Um, sure. I mean, the, if you want to access the uh, data locally, uh, we do have uh, features within the application that would allow you to do that. If you don't want to see it uh, from the server-based console, uh, there are some things you can put in place where you can review it on the local machine. Yeah. 
Uh, another question has come in saying, can you get support for issues if you're a customer? Of course, um, you know, we have a 24-7 a um, technical support team who, who provide, uh, as part of the maintenance support agreement, they do provide technical support for, uh, for customers. Um, there's another one here saying, what platforms are covered, Matt? Good question. Uh, Spectre 360, the Spectre 360 suite supports uh, Mac, uh, OS X clients, Windows clients all the way back, uh, even to Windows XP. So um, even though that's not supported by Microsoft anymore, we still can record uh, data on those older operating systems. Um, someone just mentioned or put a question in regarding uh, security of the data we're, so we're storing locally on the device map and said, with recon, if the user deletes the saved information, is that accessible to the user? So um, that data is pretty safe, right? Yeah, that's held in an, uh, in an encrypted file uh, that's random on the workstation and uh, that's not accessible to the end user. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they, even if they, even if you had someone with extensive security skills that hacked it, they couldn't view it because it's proprietary. Uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, read the information. Sure. Okay, I think the rest of them are, are probably technical. Is there anything else you see in there, Matt? Um, let's see here. A lot of good questions. A lot of technical questions that I definitely advise you guys to um, reference the admin guide. You can find e-quick answers to the how-tos right there. Yeah, we've also got the contact details. Everyone has asked questions, so we'll, we, you know, we will get back to you guys for the responses for those specific questions. Okay, uh, I, think I, think we're, uh, I think we're... There's an atta uh, attachment question. Uh, attachments are an option to monitor. You can gather that off uh, from emails uh, for sure. And, um, you know, again, in every webinar, Paul, we get a lot of questions regarding policy. And is this a breach of human rights? Is this an invasion of privacy? Um, is this legal? Uh, we get a lot of questions like that. And, you know, you can speak to uh, probably your side of the pond, uh, and I know that in the North America and the states, uh, you know, different countries and even different states, for that matter, do have different laws regarding this. Um, yeah. And you should definitely, I would say, research that uh, so that you have the appropriate policy in place. No, absolutely. You're quite right, Matt. Over here, country by country, the the, the laws are different. I think you, as an organization you need to protect yourself, you need to get some advice on that. Um, typically, you know, having wording in the acceptable use policy or even just informing the, the staff. Because bearing in mind that when, when a workstation gets powered up in the morning, you know, Spectre 360 has the ability to, to have a customizable pop-up window that comes up that, that can say whatever you want, saying, you know, this, this machine is being monitored and protected by Spectsoft or whatever it may be. So, you know, Get local, uh, get get some local advice. That's what we'd say. Right. I think the last one here, we uh, got quite a few questions on bandwidth, and um, uh, I can speak to this in saying that the application is designed to scale very large. We have uh, customers out there running thousands and thousands of endpoints. Uh, it's addressed in the uh, architecture of the application to where it synchronizes the data at intervals, very small. Uh, uh, Packets of data are sent so that it does not cause bandwidth issues, uh, even in very large environments. Uh, so obviously, in the design of the application, you know, right up the bat, we realize it's storing a lot of information. And, and what was the most uh, efficient and technically, um, obviously, best way to accomplish this? And we put a lot of research into that and a lot of development time. And uh, it's, uh, from a bandwidth perspective or a performance perspective, it's uh, uh, optimized so that it does not have that type of impact on your network and can scale to a very large uh, organization. Okay, I think we're done for questions then, Matt, I think. Yep, sounds good. And if uh, we missed anybody, uh, I'm sure we can uh, follow up with you uh, at a later date. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, the only thing we've got left to do is give away a uh, mini iPad. And I think we'll we'll hand back to Abby on that one. 
Yes, awesome. Uh, thanks, guys, for a great presentation. The winner of the iPad Mini is Simon Gregg. So, Simon, uh, just be on the lookout for an email from me um, or a PM uh, in the community if you are in Spiceworks, uh, and I will uh, get your best mailing address, and we'll get that over to you. Um, so thanks again for everyone for attending. Just wanted to remind you that you will get an email uh, in a week with a link to the recording, so be on the lookout with that, for that. Uh, with that, guys, I will let you close this out. Great. Thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, so on behalf of, of Matt and myself and, and everyone at Spectrosoft, thank you very much for your, your time and attention today. I hope it's been of uh, value to you, so thank you. Thanks, Paul, for having me. Okay, thanks guys, uh, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the afternoon. Looking forward to seeing you on future webinars.